Hello, good day everyone. TESOL International Association's Computer Assisted Language Learning Interest Section is pleased to present this webinar titled Digital Tools and Practices for Autonomous Teacher Development. Our speaker is Nick Peachy. We are very pleased to welcome all of you to this webinar. My name is Mary Allegra, and I will be one of your moderators for today's event. George Corpus will be commentating with me. Today's presentation will last 60 minutes and include a 10 minute question and answer period after Professor Peachy's presentation. To enter a question, simply type your question into the box on the lower left side of your screen and then click on the send button during the presentation. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Nick Peachy. Nick, welcome to the program. Let's get started. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. I'll just start sharing my uh, screen. Make sure that comes up fine. Should be coming up for you now. Okay, um, could whoever's here, could you please just type in a, a yes or a no, depending on whether you can see the screen? And you can use the chat to do that, please. Great, that's perfect. Good, good, good. Um, could you always also type in uh, where you are at the moment, where you're connecting from? It'd be nice to know whereabouts in the around the globe you are. Okay, we've got someone from Greece, Venezuela, India. Fantastic. Say great. A good, a good percentage of Venezuelans here. That's always good. Okay, so uh, um, I'll get started with the presentation straight away. Um, this presentation deals deals with tools and practices for autonomous teacher development. Um, if you are thinking of making notes during the presentation, you don't have to. Um, during the presentation, at the end of the presentation, I'll give you a link, and you can download all the slides from the presentation if you wish to from that link, and um, all the the links and references and everything should be there. So if you are worried about taking notes, um, don't worry, you don't have to do that. Okay. Um, I'll just do a quick introduce, introduction. Uh, this is me, or used to be me, um, a couple of years ago. Uh, this is kind of vaguely what I look like. My name is Nick Peachy. Um, I'm an author and write books on, on um, English language teaching and uh, also publish books on English language teaching at my own company, which is Peachy Publications Limited. Um, I also blog quite regularly on Blogger. Um, I write about educational technology and different um, kinds of uh, technology tools that you can use in the classroom to enhance language learning. And I'm also editor of the ELT newsletter, um, Educational Technology and ELT newsletter, which you can sign up for free from the address here if you wish to. Um, and you'll get um, a monthly um, newsletter from me from there, which is completely free, and I will have links to things like um, um, uh, latest tools and research and things like that to do with educational technology and ELT. So those are a few of the things that I do. Um, um, other things that, and here are some examples of some of my books. So I've been through that. Uh, um, this slide shows uh, I've been nominated for innovations board. One, two, three, um, I think somebody's got their microphone on. I'm picking up a lot of background noise. Great, thanks a lot. So, so far, um, I've won two of British Council Innovations Award and been non nominated four times. So that's kind of just a bit of background about me to sort of build up my ego and things like that. Um, I also write about creativity quite a lot. Um, I've uh, 
co-edited two books on creativity, Creativity in the English Language Classroom and Integrating Global Issues with in, in Creativity. Those I co-edited with our Alan Maley for the British Council. And I've also published my own book on hacking creativity, which is um, uh, published through my own publishing house, PG Publications. So that's just a kind of quick bit of background and some information about the kinds of things that I'm into. Um, I, I want to talk to you initially about getting old because that kind of links into this presentation in some ways. Uh, I don't know how old you are, but um, I'm approaching 50, well, I'm 55 and will be approaching 56 soon. Um, I make my living as a consultant and teacher trainer and writing about educational technology, which is increasingly becoming a young person's um, a young person's job, it seems. And, and uh, this was uh, highlighted to me in, in uh, possibly one of the most blunt ways possible when I recently was asked to do an interview um, on Zoom. So a young man contacted me to do an interview about educational technology. Uh, we met up on Zoom. He could see me, I could see him, and uh, he looked very confused when I appeared on the screen. And uh, he, he, it was like he kind of wanted to ask, was my son there or something like that? And uh, we continued uh, through the interview, had a very interesting interview. And at the end of the interview, he said to me, well, it's, it's so nice to meet someone of your, and I could feel that he was just about to say age. And he corrected himself and said stature, um, uh, who's interested in educational technology. And I think for me that that reaffirmed in me, with for me, the belief that you know, if you want to kind of stay relevant and you want to keep up with what's happening in in English and educational technology, then you have to take some responsibility for developing yourself and ensuring that you you know you know what's happening in your field and how things are developing. And so that's kind of what this talk is based around. It. I'm just going to share with you some of the things that I do to sort of try and keep up to date. Um, I would have thought that most of you, as you're attending a webinar, are probably quite web savvy. So I'm not sure how much of this will be new to you, but I'd just like to check. Um, I, I just put up a list of sort of vocabulary words here. Um, if there are any of those that you're not too sure about, could you just type the ones that you're not sure about into the chat window? I'll just give you a couple of minutes to, to, to look through those and make sure you know what they mean. Okay, some people are being very honest. Curation, yeah, there's one of them. Seems to be the main one that's throwing people at the moment. Yeah, okay. Are we all okay with connectivism as well? Okay, so let's push on. <laughs> you don't need to feel lonely. I'm sure there's quite a few people who are, who are keeping quiet. Um, Okay, so I'll just work through them just quickly, just to give an overall definition. Um, curation is this process of collecting and organizing and sharing, you know, um, and this is something that I do quite a lot of. Um, I collect research um, and tools. Um, and uh, Okay, that, that's the, the, the main one that he was giving you some confusion, curation, and we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, digital literacies, hopefully we're all familiar with. Um, social bookmarking, this is a process of saving links to a useful website. Um, it's something that used to be favourites, but now we can so, save those links online and, and share them and build communities around them. So social bookmarking is a really useful part of my CPD. Um, hashtags, of course, which is the, the symbol which helps you to identify the, the relevance of a, a Twitter message or a message generally, good for tagging. Facebook groups something I'm probably 
probably most of you are a member of one or two of those somewhere in the world. Uh, PLN, which is a group of people. PLN is often confused with um, with software. I've, I've heard companies marketing PLN software, but PLN really is about people and it's about building a group of people or a network of people online or face to face that can help you develop your own learning goals. So it's very much sort of personal learning and personal CV, CPD orientated. A tweet, um, which is a short Twitter message. Um, how many of you are, use Twitter regularly? Can you type in a yes or a no, depending on whether you use Twitter regularly? Quite a few no's, okay. Um, blogs, um, very clear one, something that I do quite regularly. Hopefully you will write a blog, but we'll come back to that. Social network, again, again uh, something that's often confused. People talk about Facebook being a social network. Uh, Facebook is really a software in which social network can, a social network can be created. And a network really is about you know, linking people together, and there are many platforms for building social networks. And last one, connectivism. And connectivism is in a way what this talk is based on, and that's a theory of learning to, that was developed to understand how people use online tools, social networks, and online interaction in order to, to develop their learning. So that's um, connectivism, and we'll come back to that shortly. I should be checking my time. Okay, so I've got the, the beginning of a, of a quote for you here, um, and I scrolled on too quickly. This is, this is something that I, I, I believe in fervently. I believe that teachers are like sharks, and uh, the other half of that quote is when they stop moving forward, they start to die. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's, that's very much the case, you know, and I'm sure we all know or have worked with teachers who have stopped moving forward and, uh, and uh, are still hanging around the staff room, uh, stinking the place up. And uh, I think it's very important, you know, as a teacher to keep developing your practice and, and, and keep developing your understanding of your practice. You know, I think when that stops happening, maybe it's time to go and do something else, you know, because I think you know if you aren't if you aren't ardent and passionate about teaching, then you know probably it's not the thing that you should still be doing. And so this is this talk is really about you know how we can keep moving forward. So I have a question for you, and that's how do you keep moving forward? And I'd like you to think about the things that you do um, each day, each week, each month, each year that develop your teaching. I mean, of course, one of them is being here now, you know, you've come to this webinar, obviously it's an attempt to, to get some to, some development. So if you could just type in the kinds of things that you do to, to develop your teaching, I'd, I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. Yeah, great. Good variety of things there. Um, I did some research when I was writing this presentation a couple of years ago originally when I designed it. I, I did some research to find out kind of what teachers did and, and what was most popular with them. And uh, these are some of the things that they came up with. And um, if you have a look at that list there, um, have a look and see how many of those things that you do. You can have a quick count through and see how many that you do. 
you can type in the number if you're very brave as well. Five is good. Eight is very good. Great. Fantastic, yeah. Yeah, I assumed that, actually, I assumed doing this, giving this presentation online that people would be a lot more um, would be a lot more involved in these kinds of things than, than most people when often when they speak at, at physical conferences the number of these things that they do are, are, are kind of far less okay so um when i did my research i asked uh, teachers some of the pros and cons of the different methods and i asked them which one uh, and i tried to find out which one was the most popular and which one most teachers do which do you think is the most common on there do you think type, you can type it in if you think you know which is the most commonly done kind of CPD that most teachers said they did oh, that's interesting nobody said it yet uh, maybe it was because of of the context in which I did it, but but actually the most popular one was go to a conference, and most teachers said that this was their most common and popular form of CPD, and that kind of worried me a bit because you know how many conferences can you go to in a year? Um, I can't attend that many, and how many can you go to in a month or a week? You know, whereas I feel that you know professional development is something that we should be doing every day, you know, and it should be, you know, okay, conferences are great, and it's great to meet up with people, but, you know, I think, you know, these are things that we should be doing every day, and that your, your, I kind of feel like your teaching brain is a bit like a muscle, if you only exercise it once or twice a year, then you're not going to stay particularly fit, so, um, so I'll move on to, to something that I, I believe is true, um, and that's that. Uh, actually, uh, maybe you agree with me. How many of you actually agree with me? Everything you know, everything you need to know to keep developing your teaching can be found online. You can type in either agree or disagree. Ninety percent. We're hedging our bets. Okay. Yeah. I'd I'd kind of like to to kind of contextualise that comment. I I do believe that's true, but there is a problem with that, and this is this is the problem. This is what's happening in an internet minute. You no. Know, and. Uh, this shows the scope of, scope of our problem. With so much internet activity happening and so many things being published constantly online, you know, we have to, how do we find and dig into quickly and conveniently the part of that information that's going to be most useful for us? And uh, so I moderated my, my sentence and adapted it a bit to this, which is, you know, Everything you need to know to keep developing your teaching can be found online somewhere. It's a case of, you know, the where, which is the problem. And uh, so that's kind of what this talk is about. Um, it's about how do we become information literate in the internet age and how do we access those, those materials and those development uh, those development resources that we need in a quick and efficient way and and how do we work in a in a kind of connectivist way in order to develop our teaching and uh, what I'd like to share you with you in the rest of this presentation is some of the things that I do um, let's see if I can make all of that visible for me this is kind of the 
the cycle that I work through of, of my own kind of self evaluate self development and uh, it involves going around this cycle uh, constantly and that's my kind of information literacy cycle and I work through these different stages in order to kind of continuously be to be developing my teaching or my practice I should say as I don't do so much teaching anymore okay and what I'd like to do is sort of show you how I work through those stages I mean one of the things that I I use quite a lot is Twitter you know, and I know that, that quite a few of you I think when when I when I mentioned Twitter and were you on Twitter there are quite a few no's and I'm kind of wondering if this isn't the reason and I, I think this this picture for me represents Twitter and it, it's like you know this huge crowd of millions and millions of people all shouting at once and, so, and, and when so many people are shouting it can become very difficult to listen and hear what you need to hear and so for me this is the, the key of the key to this is knowing how to ignore the irrelevant and how to find what's relevant for you and that's how you make use of Twitter and I think that the most important part of Twitter is actually the hashtags and these are some examples of some very useful hashtags or ones that I use to find information so if you go to Twitter and you actually type in one if you have a look at the search part and you actually type in one of these hashtags you know um, what what it will do is it will filter the information and only find you information on Twitter that has been posted which is using one of these hashtags to show relevance and what you'll find is people who understand how to use Twitter well will always ha add a hashtag to anything they post and that will make it easier for people to find it as well as that I have a very useful piece of software and this is something called TweetDeck and as you can see there are I'm not sure how clear my screenshot is there are columns here there are a number of columns and at the top of each column you, sh you may just be able to, to see that there's a hashtag at the top of each column so TweetDeck is a tool that, that I can set up with my Twitter account and then I can choose hashtags to go at the top of these columns and it filters all the information on Twitter that is relevant to each of those hashtags so by doing this you know I have these this row of information streams about different things that I'm interested in so my first column is all articles that have been shared with the hashtag ed reform which is educational reform the second one is web tools the third one is ELT so this is uh, yeah I'll, I'll share the link with you later on it's called TweetDeck and it's a free tool that, that once you have a Twitter account that you can use and set up so whenever I need to access Twitter and find information or when I'm having my, my uh, coffee in the morning and I want to do my personal professional development I come to TweetDeck and I can see what has been posted that's relevant to those different key areas of interests for me so that's very useful and a great way to find you know links to different um, information and of course each of these columns has each of these tweets has links to uh, maybe a video or maybe a blog article or a research or an e-document that I can find and read which is relevant to this so that's a great way of using Twitter more effectively and efficiently to find the information that you need of course the other great tool is is finding the right people to, to follow and these are some Twitter people that you know I can recommend you you follow if you're interested in TESOL or, or English language teaching um, you can download this presentation later um, and you can click through those and see which ones you're interested in following and uh, there are some great examples there if you see the kinds of people these people follow as well then you can sort of build up a wider audience as well or a wider following but even if you just followed these the people on this list I'm sure that will provide you with loads of information and loads of things to read uh, during for your professional development 
Uh, the next thing I use is uh, Facebook. Um, and uh, how many of you are regular Facebook users? Can you type in an FB yes or FB no, depending on how often you use Facebook, whether you're regular or not? FB yes, yeah. I guess most people might be. I've used Facebook for a long time. I started off with just a personal account and then I found that all my personal friends were getting mixed up with my professional friends. So I started a Facebook page, which was good for a while, but didn't solve the problem. But it was a great way for me to share things. So I share lots of things on this Facebook page, Facebook ICT for ELT. And um, since doing that, I've also started joining Facebook groups. And I find that Facebook groups are actually uh, a lot more useful. There are loads of different groups on Facebook um, on all uh, aspects of teaching. Um, m many of them are very location specific, so it's great to sort of find ones that are kind of relevant to you. And these are great places to find, you know, to find sort of re uh, relevant information that you can look through when you're looking for your to get some professional development. And this is what I do. My first you know, 10, 15 minutes of the day while I'm having my coffee is go to a Facebook group and see if anyone's posted anything interesting there or see what my alerts are telling me. And again, these are some useful Facebook groups that you can sort of look, uh, join in with if you're, if you're looking for good information. These ones are, are very busy ones and they're ones that usually have sort of a good degree of quality they're also kind of quite well moderated, so they're not taking too much spam or advertising or anything like that. So if you're looking for a few groups to join in Facebook, these are very good relevant ones that should keep you supplied with uh, plenty of information. Okay, so it's, it's, it's great sort of going out to those places and finding information, but you know, one of the other thing, nice things that I like to do is get the information to come to me because again, that can save a lot of time. And I have a tool for doing that and it's uh, something called Paperly. And Paperly is a, a, a web-based tool that helps you create your own uh, daily newspaper. And what you do is you go to the Paperly site and where it says get fresh content about here, you type in the theme that you're interested in. And then when you click on that, Paperly will cr create a kind of digital newspaper for you based around the keywords that you type in there. And what will happen is um, once, you've, once you've given them your email address, each day you will get an email, in, uh, an email message and it will it will contain your personalized newspaper, your personalized uh, paperly newspaper, which should look something like this. So here's what my one looks like in the morning. So the, each morning I get a message that looks like this in my email inbox. It's personalized to my own interests and only draws on, on things that I'm very interested in. And you know, then I can click through these while I'm having my morning coffee and check out the various links and various articles. You know, I don't have to check out all of them, but you know, it means that information is coming to me. I'm not having to go to lots of different places to look for it. And uh, so that's something that I really like to do with my morning coffee each day. Uh, and, and that I think is sort of a great tool. Okay, the other tool that I like a lot, and again, because it, it sends information to me, is a, a social bookmarking site called Digo. And again, D yeah, I have, I have a lot of coffee and very large cups of coffee, so that really helps me develop. That's my ex excuse for, for drinking a lot of coffee. It's my development time. Yeah, so Digo is a, is a great social bookmarking tool. It's somewhere where if you find a useful article, or, or a useful blog post or a useful infographic, you can save it. But like Facebook, Digo also has groups. So you can, if, if you think it's relevant for a specific group, you can actually share it into the group. And these, these groups are created by people who have very similar interests. 
So once you join these groups, you can see what other people are sharing while they're drinking their coffee in the morning. And uh, you can check through these. And if you sign up for a digest, it will send you an email once a week or once a day or every day, giving you um, the latest updates from me. I'll just click through to a group if I can and share a link, show you what it looks like. Uh, you can't see that, but I can share. A, I should go back and share a link with you. So this is a link to the, the kind of groups that I follow. And you'll share, see there that there are a kind of number of various links and, uh, and, and different groups and links. I'm not sure if you got the link. Did you get the link? Try sharing. Oh yeah, there it is. Yeah. So, you know, if you join these groups and then you get regular emails from them from people who who are interested in the same things as you as you, and you'll find out what they're saving and what they're what they're interested in. So this is a great way to get really soft personalised information that's sort of key to your kind of interests. And again, it comes to your email inbox every day. So, you know, you don't have to go looking for it and searching for it, which is always you know, very helpful. So you can look through those links. Uh, what you'll get is something that looks a bit like this, message that looks a bit like this. Um, and then I can just sort of click, click through the and see if there's in, anything I'm interested in reading in more depth. So again, that's a great tool for kind of creep, keeping up to date. Of course, having lots of information is is great, but you have to start sort of processing all that information and finding something to do with it. And uh, this is uh, this is something that where curation comes in. And you know, as you're you're looking through those things. You know, and, and reading those new articles, not everything is going to be good. So you don't want to save everything and you don't want to share everything. So these are some sort of key questions that I ask myself when I decide whether I actually want to share or save this. You know, you know did I learn something new from it? Did it confront my existing beliefs? Always good to have your beliefs confronted. Will you need to, to find and use it again? Can you use it in your classroom or for research? Would others benefit from it? And if the answer is yes to these things or, or any one of these things, then I think it's worth sharing and worth curating and collecting. There are a number of tools for curating and collecting things. There's a very um, nice one, an easy one to use called Bag the Web. And it, it looks a bit like this. It creates these kind of bags where you can, you can save things that are relevant to to your specific interests. So I can save everything that's to do with reading skills in there, whether it's tools or articles or lessons uh, or vocabulary um, or pronunciation. So I can have a bag for each thing. And when I want to design a reading lesson or want to design a vocabulary lesson or need, need some tools or something like that for a presentation, I can but go to these bags and find uh, anything I've saved in them and curated into them. The other curation tool I use quite a lot is this one, which is called Scoop It. And uh, these are very public ones. So, you know, and I split those into two. I have one where I save articles and, and news, and one where I save links to kind of digital tools. And, uh, you know, over the years, I've, I've saved more than you know, 2,500 articles and about 1,500 different free tools there. And there, there are places where I know I can always go and, uh, and, uh, find the things that I've been reading or finding useful. And uh, I'll share these with you now. This is the, the news one. Um, this, is, and this is where I share it, say kind of educational technology news and share it with people. And you can build up followers on here. So I've got about, you know, it becomes something like a newspaper and there are about 35,000 30,000 subscribers on this, these two different sites now. So every day when I find something useful, I can sort of share it with other people and they can also benefit from it, hopefully. Um, this one is the one on um, sharing different tools. So again, you know, this is where I shared and curated different tools for, for uh, developing language learning and lots of different things I can find there. And, uh, so I just go back there every time I'm looking for different tools to do different things or 
or uh, or uh, if I'm doing research into different things. So those are my methods. And you know that that process of deciding what I share and what I keep, you know, is part of that developmental process of evaluation, and and, and you know that engages you cognitively with the information a little more, rather than just bookmarking things and never coming back to them, which often happens. Okay, information is great, but you know we have to make it. How do we get from having information and into making that not into knowledge and skill? And so that's that's the part I'd like to move on to just briefly. And of, of course, the first thing is that, I, and the most important thing is, um, use it in your classroom and reflect on it. So if you're if you're finding new digital tools or you're reading about different methodologies, you know, great, take them into the classroom, use them, try them out, and reflect on them. And I think one of the greatest ways to reflect is to you know create your own blog and start writing about the, the things that you're thinking, the things that you're reading, the things that you're trying out in your classroom. Uh, this is a, a great quote about blogging that I really love. You know. um, how many of you have blogs? You can type in a yes or a no, depending on whether you have a blog. Can you type in a yes or a no to the chat window? Wow. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't really recommend having a blog too much. You know, I think you know, blogging is a great thing, and for me personally, it's that it's really helped to kind of enhance my career. I started blogging about, I guess, back in, you know, I, I think my first attempt was about 2005, and then I started blogging regularly from about 2007. Uh, I used to work from, for the British Council as, a, as a, a manager within the British Council developing their websites for teachers. And in 2011, uh, sorry, 2007, I left the British Council and became a freelance. And I suddenly realized that, you know, um, I had nothing to show people what I did. You know, all the work that I'd done kind of belonged to the British Council. So I started writing a blog and uh, sort of publishing content, publishing ideas and things like that. And that was a, a really kind of a really useful developmental process for a number of reasons. I mean, firstly, it kind of helped me to build up a, a kind of portfolio of my work. So when I was applying for jobs, you know, it really helped to be able to show people the kinds of things that I did. It helped me build up an audience for my work, which, and, and I got some feedback, which was very nice as well. And it helped me develop as a writer. You know, when, when you're kind of writing it, um, regularly you start develop to develop that skill and that becomes a very useful skill for teachers and i guess the other thing that that i think is really useful about blogging is that when you're reflecting on the things that you do and you put them in writing and then you decide to publish them publicly there's a there's a very kind of powerful moment where you have to question yourself of, you know, is this really what I believe? Does this really make sense? Am I talking rubbish? And that that really does, that publish button really pushes you to, to reflect um, quite deeply because, you know, once it's published, it's potentially out there for as long as the internet exists, you know. It's very hard to take something back especially once people have seen it, it's been archived, somebody's commented on it, you know, you're really putting your, your beliefs to the test and putting them out there in public. And I think however time consuming it may be, even if you only do it once a week or once a month or, you know, once every two months, I think it's a really useful process and a really kind of good part of your develop, personal development. And yet, and a great thing to have on your CV. And I know, you know, speaking from personal experience now, um, of, of the work that I get, the vast majority of it comes to me, and it comes to me because of the things that I do and the blogging that I do and the curating that I do. You know, I know that if I have to apply for work and I have 
to send in a CV and I have to write an application, I'm actually not very good at getting jobs, which is not a good thing to be as a freelancer because you have to be good at getting jobs. But you know, I'm very lucky that you know I constantly worked and published materials and developed my writing and it's out there on in public and so a lot of the time I don't have to apply for work anymore. The work comes to me and you know I'm able to do that and I'm able to you know build an income from the work that I do. And all of that, you know, you know, it comes back to blogging and developing that ability. So I think that's a really good develop ability to develop. You know, as teachers we should be really good writers and we should write about and reflect on what we do. Um, if you're interested in starting a blog and you haven't got one already, there's a couple of suitable platforms. Medium is a very fashionable platform at the moment. Um, lots of very kind of high-profile people um, blog on Medium, but you know, it, it's a very useful tool. You can do it. I still use the very, very old and traditional blogger that was one of the first blogging websites. If you want to get into a bit more detail and you're, you're a bit more web savvy, then you can use WordPress. If you don't want to blog very often, but you do want it to build your professional profile, then you can go to LinkedIn and you can build a kind of blog on LinkedIn and you can publish articles there. And so they're connected to your, you know, your, your, your professional profile there on LinkedIn and the networks that you're part of there on LinkedIn. And, and those can be, that can be a very useful place to publish your opinions. Yeah, EduBlogs is good too. EduBlogs is uh, based on WordPress, I think, but it gives you your own version of WordPress. So that's a, a good, easy way to do it. I'm still using Blogger and it, it kind of still works okay for me though. So those are good platforms. Um, if you're looking for other people's blogs and you want to get inspiration, Vicky Howlett published some time ago this very useful kind of, of uh, index of different ELT bloggers. Um, it's not always 100% up to date, and uh, as as most of you see, you know, not everybody sticks with blogging forever. But if you're looking for so, some inspiration and to see what other people are writing and how they write, sort of things they write about, then it's worth coming here and having a look because there are loads and loads of different blogs by various ELT professionals there, um, from some of the unknowns to some of the more uh, more well-known names and I think that's sort of something that's well worth checking out. So um, by all means check out that link later and, uh, and get some inspiration from different bloggers there. If you want some recommended, uh, is Scott Thorne's his blog which is an A to Z of ELT which is a great blog and again something that he started as a, as a hobby and built into and eventually became published as a book for Macmillan, which is, you know, I think that's great if you can, you can start off a great way to develop your career through blogging and into writing. Of course, Scott was already well published, so, you know, that's, that wasn't a, a big step for him, but for, you know, people like me, that was a, it was a great step and a great way into to sort of becoming a writer and getting more writing work. Someone else you can check out, of course, is uh, Shelley Trail. I think she's already been recommended here once. She writes Teacher Reboot Camp, and, you know, and that's a, another, you know, regularly updated blog with lots of great information on it, uh, particularly about technology. And uh, Shelley's been, like me, has been sort of knocking out um, blog posts on a regular basis for some years. And again, you know, it's something that, that I think Things really helped develop her career professionally, you know, from being someone who was just sort of teaching class in Germany to someone now who's who has an international reputation for for ELT and, and gets to talk to people all over the world. You know, what a great what could be a better recommendation for self blogging than someone who can make that kind of journey? That's you know, that's really fantastic. So, you know, check out her blog and try and get some inspiration there. Um, Russell Stannard, who probably a, a lot of you have heard of, he's sort of more of a video blogger. He publishes sort of video clips on his blog, and, and they're mo mostly about sort of uh, helping you learn how to use various aspects of technology. You know, if you don't feel that you're a good writer, but you feel that you're a good talker, uh, then this could be a great example for, for you to get inspiration from, or, or a great, great way to sort of model your blog on, you know, 
I know that you know, personally, I, I can do what Russell does. I can't sit in front of a, a webcam and record myself talking, but he's really excellent at it, and and you know that's his strength. And uh, you know, so if if that, if you feel that's where your strength lies in talking to the to the video camera, then that's great. Personally, I I, I feel that I'm not. Uh, um, um, uh, aesthetically pleasing enough to get away with that, but, but, uh, um, that, but if you feel that you are, by all means have a go. So what next? You know, we've we've got our various things. Um, we've moved around the cycle uh, through these these different actions using various tools, and of course, the the main thing I think is you know if you're curating information, collecting information, reflecting it, you're writing your blog. You're developing your teaching is you know be sure to share it you know start putting if you do start blogging if you start creating videos if you start curating you know start sharing that stuff with with the global community of ELT because you know that's something that can be then then be useful you know make your own professional development into other people's professional development and, you know and that's one of the things that I've tried to do and through curation and through blogging as well, and, and something that's been really rewarding for me. So you know, be sure to share. You know, don't 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 just keep your development to yourself. Um, here are some tips to get started. Um, you know, I think if you're if you're going to develop yourself and you're going to commit to developing yourself. You know, make a specific time for it each day. You know, as I've said, my my time is that you know first 15 to 30 minutes in the morning when I'm having my coffee. Um, you know, I go get while the rest of the house is still sleeping, and you know, I go through these things and have a look at them and do some writing. You know, I enjoy it, so I found myself getting up earlier every morning to do it, and and that's been a great way to develop myself. You no, know, have a regular time to do it. Be selective. Don't think that you have to read every link that's posted on Twitter or that you have to read all of every link. Just find the things that really speak to you and that, that you know you feel are really important for you. Um, I, I think you know this other one about procrastination. I mean, I, I think a lot of us uh, as teachers have you know I think everyone has this tendency to procrastinate. We whether it's marking that pile of you know, student essays, or whether it's doing the washing up, or whether it's cooking or tidying the house, you know, my my advice is make procrastination time learning time. So if you want to procrastinate, you know, do something useful with it. Just go and look through a Facebook group where people are posting useful things, or you know, go to your bookmarks, or or have a look at your uh, or at your links. So you know. Be sure to do that, you know, and, and, and use use your procrastination time in a, in in a good way. Do something with what you learn. Try to enjoy it and try to have a plan. And these are so, some ideas of you know some recommendations of things that you could plan. You know, you don't have to plan all of these. Choose one and and make that your next plan for the next two to three weeks, and then maybe choose a different plan. You know, try out lots of different things. You know, you're already here doing the webinar. Try something else. Try writing a blog post. Decide to write one once a month and see how that goes. You know, lots of different things that you can do, plans that you can have. If you plan to develop yourself and you commit to it, then it's much more likely to happen. Um, there are some links here to videos that can help you do some of this stuff. Um, I'm running out of time. There's a link to to a, an, a video on connectivism here. Uh, when you download the presentation, I, I really recommend you watch it. It's about five minutes long, and it talks about connectivist theory and how it affects the relationship between teachers and learners. So I really rec highly recommend you watch that. And um, you know, and I think about the other thing to start thinking about is you know, connectivism is something that I'm trying to do now as an adult who's 55 years old. Uh, for my daughters, I have two daughters, one who's 20, one who's four. They'll grow up with, in this connected world with these skills, doing these things naturally. You know, um, when they go to school, I want them to be taught by, by, by people who understand those things. You know, the people that we'll be teaching, you know, in five, ten years' time will, will be people who've grown up with the, with a kind of connectivist approach to learning. Let's kind of understand that and help them to use that. And there's the last thing. If you want to download the presentation, you can either scan this code, or there's a link at the bottom there, 
um, which may be a little bit off your screen. I'm not sure it's so sure that's a link and you can do out, download the whole presentation from that link. I'll just um, share a link with you to the to the presentation. If you want to load it, um, that's it. And so if you have any questions, I'll be happy to spend the last kind of 10 minutes answering questions if you'd if, if there are any, I don't know how the questions work, either you type them in or you can get audio, audio hold a webinar, webinar or what I've not not here, but as you suggested, is that about less than a minute ago. Um, how to hold a webinar isn't on the list, but there are lots of great um, free softwares that you can use for, for creating webinars. If you go to the the site that I had about um, different tools, uh, the Scoop It site, you can find sort of webinar and free um, uh, video conferencing uh, uh, tools there. I'll just pass the link to you if I can find it. Yeah, that one. If you go there, I know there are a few links on there to sort of free uh, webinar type tools. And uh, you know, so you know, organize it and, and give it a try. Uh, is the future of education online? Um, I think the, the present of education are, are, is already online. You know, I don't see um, online resources totally killing off the face-to-face uh, -face learning, although I think more and more of, of our learning will be going online. Um, more and more online teaching is going to happen as connectivity gets better around the world. and. Um, and as we we kind of learn to use it much more, so I think there's going to be much more more that we can learn online, and that, that you know, especially for young people, that they already do. You know, I think you know online provides us with a huge opportunity to learn. Um, it will, I think, it will change the nature of face to face, but that you know, there are still things that you will need to do face to face. You know, online is a you know, video conferencing is a great way to learn how to video conference with people. But you know, if you want to learn how to interact with people face to face, and that's always going to be something that we need to do, I hope, then you need to do that face to face, whether it's in a classroom or, or uh, in an office or, or, one, or in a private tutorial, I don't know. But you know, those are things that we're still going to need to do. Um, any more questions? If there are any more questions, I'll be happy to ask them if you want to type them in. There is one question, Nick, here. I, it seems to be very interesting. William Gonzalez says, is the future of education online? Um, yeah, that was that was one of the things that I was just talking about. That, you know, I think it is online, or a lot of it is online already. You know, and incre increasingly we're see seeing more and more blended learning. You know, there I think there are hardly any. You know, there are hardly any um, uh, courses or teachers who don't at least use some element of blended learning, even if it's just recommending the odd website to their students. You know, they might not actually use the internet in their classroom, but they're using some form of blended learning in terms of recommendations. So you know, I think you know, it certainly is. You know some element of it is online and increasingly more and more. I've kind of lost my presentation now. There it is. Happy to answer any more questions if anybody wants to ask anything else. Not, I can. Uh, I can use the next seven minutes to give you a free book. Um, transition to to being a freelance. Um, it, it's uh, to going from going to having a regular job to becoming freelance. Yeah, it can be quite uh, frightening. At the time, I was lucky that you know my partner, who I was with at the time, had a sort of regular job and a regular income, and that makes it a bit less scary. 
And nowadays that isn't the case. And, you know, I'm sort of totally dependent on my freelance income. So it can be, you know, it can be quite, quite scary, but, you know, it's also, you know, made my life much, much more interesting, but, you know, you have to balance one thing with the other and I do much more things that I like now that I, you know, I can choose what I do. Main differences between digital literacy and information literacy. Um, I would say that information literacy is a part of digital literacy. You know, it, it's just one small part of, you know, of, of knowledge management. I think di digital literacy come, covers a whole range of things from, you know, uh, fact checking, um, checking whether information is accurate or not, finding information, search, you know, digital note taking, you know, building digital resources, collaborating digital, digitally. Information literacy is one small part of that. So digital, digital literacy is the kind of bigger field, I think. Okay. Well, if there aren't any more questions, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to you know, let you all go and download the presentation, check through the links, you know, have a look at the resources, and, and I hope those are useful and, and help you in your professional development. And, uh, and I hope that you, that you all have blogs soon and are writing about the things that you, can, you do, because I think that's a kind of great part, great thing that you can do with your professional development. If you only do that one thing, I think that's kind of, you know, enough to keep you developing for quite a while yeah. and of course share your blogs as well it's, it's, it's sad that I think a lot of teachers don't feel that they they have anything different to say and I and I think that that's you know that's absolutely not true if you've been teaching for any length of time and you're able to reflect on what you do everybody's experience is unique and i think you know use use your experience and you know reflect on your unique experience and and you know other people will find that interesting i'll just type in my email address so if you need to drop me a line the email address is there and um and good luck with that. You know, I hope you, uh, I hope you enjoy it and keep developing your teaching, and you become healthy sharks. <laughs> <laughs>